Freemasonry, an ancient fraternity shrouded in mystery. With roots stretching back to the medieval stonemasons, its age-old traditions have remained virtually unchanged for centuries. When people hear the word Freemason, they think about funny handshakes, uh, they think about rolled up trouser legs. If you do a little bit of Googling, it's a cabal of people that are taking over governments and things. Freemasonry, secrecy, secret society, 100%. Now, as the Brotherhood celebrates its 300th anniversary, the United Grand Lodge of England is allowing the cameras in for the first time to reveal what really goes on behind closed doors. Right, now, will you bugger off? <laughs> <laughs> With unprecedented access, we lift the veil of secrecy to discover what it means to be a modern-day Freemason. I feel a bit inadequate. It's a lot of fancy aprons. A lot of fancy aprons. From the regalia... My mum might say I look like a complete Wally, but you can never please your mum. Forward, brethren. ...to the lavish ceremonies... You will seal that with your lips. ...and ancient rituals... Do you have anything to give in the name of charity? No. All of the rituals that we do, which are like little plays, I love them. <laughs> and of course, the unbreakable bonds of brotherhood. Yeah. Some of that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Describe it, you go, why would anyone want to do that? But once you're in it, you get it. You know the New Year's song, Ord Lang Syne? That's Mason Masonic. Yeah. You know, take my hand. There's a, there's a second verse which goes, Take my hand, my trusted brother, and sing along with me. Du, 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 du. Yeah. Six million men across the globe are members of the world's oldest fraternity. For some, it provides a social network, a moral code, or a reassuring sense of order. For others, it's just a good meal out with mates. But whatever their reasons for joining, as they're immersed in Freemasonry's traditions, they're bound together by ritual and sacred oaths to become brothers. One of Masonry's biggest brothers is Pro Grand Master Peter Lowndes, second only to the Grand Master, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Kent. I'm afraid people are going to have to listen to me for a bit in the usual way, but I'm probably going to be speaking for a little bit longer than usual myself. Today, Peter summoned his fellow rulers to finalise plans for one of the year's key events, quarterly communication, where the big decisions regarding Freemasonry are made. We meet four times a year, Without the quarterly communications, we really actually couldn't run Freemasonry. And then everybody will have heard enough of me and we can return for lunch. Retire for lunch. Processing these Masonic titans into the Grand Temple and choreographing the entire event is the considerable responsibility of the Grand Director of Ceremonies. Brethren, would you like to take a seat, please? The aptly named Oliver Lodge. Unless you're guest speakers, you're in the wrong seat. It's my job to direct Grand Lodge. So that means that it's for me to make sure that everybody knows what they're going to do and that they're in the right place at the right time. I need to be able to deal with the situation if something goes wrong. You're only wearing at the back at the moment, is that right? In which case you'll no doubt want to have the end seat rather than one in. Being Grand Director of Ceremonies in the United Grand Lodge of England is without question the best job in the whole of world Freemasonry, because everybody has to do what you tell them to do. Over the past nine years, Oliver has presided over more than 40 major ceremonies. Right, brethren, let us do simple things well, such as remaining in step, so that this looks impressive. Right, let's try it. Heads up, your grand stewards now. At this time every year, Oliver must break in a new team. Shambles at the back. You don't need to get 
very close to the man in front. It will just make it difficult for you to step off later. The purpose of the ceremonies is to be impressive. Not quite so good at the back. I was in the army for half a dozen years, like all officers. I spent a while at Sandhurst in advance, uh, doing a lot of drill and other bits and pieces. Be seated, brethren. Now, sit first one second. It's still not out of it, Stan. Now it is. You're with us. Here you see the Grand Master or the Pre Grand Master presiding over Grand Lodge. So it is a, a symbol of the structure that we have. The procession and the whole ceremony is a symbol of the, the worldwide brotherhood, which is Freemasonry. To become a fully-fledged member of this worldwide brotherhood, every Mason must first go through the most powerful of all Masonic rituals, the Third Degree. Craft Freemasonry is divided into three degrees. The first degree deals with your birth, the second degree deals with your time in this world, and the third degree deals with your departure from this world. Learning about the fact that one day you'll die, that's what makes the third degree even more poignant. Nobody who does that ceremony, or goes through that ceremony, if it is done well, will forget the experience. Although I do play a mean Roman Keaton, but I'll abide that, I can't sing. What else can I do? Hero Enrique Iglesias. No, that went wrong. 25-year-old Gary Hacking will soon go through his third degree and become a master mason. He lives in Bolton with his girlfriend, Laura. I'm not singing the rest of it, ever. Would you dance if I ask you to do no, Go away. As a full-time nurse, Gary works alongside 50 women, so was in search of male company. He joined the Freemasons nine months ago. I moved away from my friends in Bury, uh, moved somewhere else, and then it was very hard to maintain like, a, that sort of male bonding, which I know some people say sounds quite wet, but I think men do need other men to associate with. It's part of life. And as great as the women I work with are, and as amazingly funny and social as they are, you sometimes just need a bit of that man-to-man -man bonding time, really. For months, Gary's been consumed with preparing for his third degree ceremony and learning his part in the secret ritual, which has remained virtually unchanged for 300 years. I'll have to answer some questions, but I have to get them right, obviously. Um, and then from there, they will then proceed to sort of raise me to the third degree. But getting these questions, it's... The language is a bit sort of archaic, so it's very hard to try and get your head around it. You want to get it right, though, because you carry on the tradition. It shows that you, you know, you've put the time, you've put the effort in, and that you're interested. I keep asking him questions about it, and he's like, I'm not allowed to tell you. I don't know. Stop asking me questions. And then he'll... Um, He'll randomly run out of the room. You can hear him muttering to himself. And then he'll come back and I'm like, who are you talking to? It's like, oh, just Mason stuff. And I get really annoyed because he won't tell me what it is. But tonight, Laura's being allowed a first glimpse inside Gary's secret world. He's taking her to a Masonic ladies' night. You know you've got to kiss the Grandmaster, don't you? No. Yeah, with Tom. Yeah. It's part of the ritual. I, I highly doubt that's part of the ritual. I've got to do it. You've got to do it. Oh, you can go first then. Show me how it's done. Tonight's event is being held here at Bolton Wanderers Football Club. Oh, I didn't print the tickets out. Oh! The annual Grand Ball has been running for 156 years, and this is the first time that non Master Masons like Gary have been invited. It's a lot of fancy aprons. A lot of fancy aprons. This is like the Masonic equivalent of penis envy. In Freemasonry, the apron signifies rank. Gary's currently second degree, so he wears the slightly underwhelming fellow craft apron. Ladies and brethren, 
brethren, will you please stand to receive the president of the 156th Grand Masonic Festival and Ball, Right Worshipful Brother James Anthony Harrison. Ladies' nights in masonry are not only a chance for long-suffering wives and partners to see what their men get up to, they're also meant as a thank you for their indulgence and support. The climax to the evening is the 150-year-old Grand March, when over a thousand master masons and their partners parade around the ballroom, though no one really knows why. Tonight is one of the last events Gary will attend as a second degree fellow craft mason. It's been a dream of 11 years to be a, a master mason. I don't know what's going to happen. Everyone keeps telling me it's like a really good ceremony. So I'm looking forward to it. A bit scared, but excited at the same time because it's just going to be the fulfillment of something that I've been wanting to do for years. That experience that you have in that third degree ceremony might change it forever. But when I go through the, the third, it's going to be big. This is the apron of a third degree master mason. The basic story of Freemasonry is the building of King Solomon's temple, and it's from that story that we take our ritual. In Bolton, it's the day of Nurse Gary Hacking's third degree ceremony, when he hopes to be raised to the rank of Master Mason. And here is the final thing for the third degree. Are you allowed to see in this? You are, right, okay. So, um, tie, gloves, and then this last month was the final time I'll have to wear that. That's the apron of a fellow craft. You've seen that before, I'm sure, by now. But this is what I've been waiting to wear for some time. So this is the apron. Oh, gosh. This is the apron of the Master Mason. This has been encased in there for a good six months now. Um, just waiting to crack this out. I can't wait. Um, really excited. And as soon as you do that, not even kidding. Business. You mean business. The third degree is the most powerful, most secretive, and most dramatic of all Masonic rituals. In it, the candidate is put through a reenactment of the legend upon which all Freemasonry is based the murder of Hiram Abiff the stonemason responsible for the building of King Solomon's temple, killed for refusing to divulge the secrets of a master mason. What time are we kicking off now? Uh, half six. Half six. Right, I've got enough time to neck half a pint. <sighs> Nothing can prepare you for the third degree. It is um, mind-blowing. <sighs> you all right? Yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Are you ready for tonight? Nervous. Yeah. Nothing to be nervous about. I know, I know. By the end of tonight's ceremony, Gary will have been made to come to terms with his own death. I'm totally nervous. Is this time the room is going to be true where they're going to whip out a goat? Or is this time going to be the time I need clean boxes? You, know, you never really know what you're actually going to be doing. Nervous, pal. Nervous. Why is there a sheet on the floor? It's out of nowhere. It's real now. It's proper real. Please be upstanding to receive the worshipful master and his wardens. To preserve the mystery and drama for future candidates, the third degree ceremony must remain secret. The third degree, although it deals with death, is not a morbid ceremony at all, um, quite the opposite. It's an enlightening ceremony. It looks at your departure from this life and your rebirth into, into life in the future. 
you as a brother experience something which happened to our master, Hiram Abith, being slain? There is a grave, and in this country, that grave is always empty and just has the emblems of mortality displayed upon it. Rebirth comes into it very strongly because you're brought back to life, as it were, within that ritual. In Ireland, somebody is actually lowered into a grave, as they do up in Cambridge, and they walk across the top of the gate while a gong sounds. It's preparation for a time so that you will indeed live respected and die regretted. Part of the ceremonies is understanding that your life is finite and you have to deal with that in your own way. If you considered the fact that you're going to die, would you not make the most of that life knowing with the emotional intelligence that you were going to die eventually? And that's what it gave for me. You know, I work with death all the time. It's, it's a sad part of life, but it's a part of life nonetheless. At that profound moment, if you sit there and take it in, you know that you've got to spend the next however long you've got your life making the absolute most of it. Hiram Abiff, the master stonemason at the centre of the third degree ceremony, is a minor biblical character around whom Freemasonry has constructed their entire building analogy. In Masonic circles, he's also known as the widow's son. These hairy bikers are all Freemasons. They're known as the Widow's Sons. Members must have passed through their third degree ceremony and be fully fledged Master Masons. But as the sons gather for one of their charity bike rides, there's one notable absentee, their leader, Peter Younger. Raised a Freemason, branded a Widow's Son. The pinnacle of my Freemasonry was joining the Widow Sons. It's just a brilliant organisation. The, the strength of friendship is just unbelievable. And it's, it's some of the happiest times of my life has been through its membership. And although I've put an awful lot into Widow Sons, what I've gained back from it's just been immeasurable. But recently, outings with his biking brothers have been rare. Just before Christmas in 2015, while out with his wife, Anne-Marie, tragedy struck. This is Anne-Marie and I. This was actually taken um, just before she collapsed. We were at a, a, a black tie Christmas function. We hadn't been there long, we'd gone to the bar, reception drinks, and we're walking along to the dining room and uh, we stopped for a, a photograph to be taken. And just as the photograph was taken, she says, I don't feel well. And she collapsed. She was taken off um, into her recovery room, and I never saw her again, alive. And then you're faced with the... How to tell a seven-year-old that she's lost her mum. Which is the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life. Anne-Marie had suffered a heart attack. Ever since, Peter's focus has been on helping his daughter, Amy, come to terms with their loss. First, I'm going to tell you about this necklace here, which is all the things are connected to a memory about her. So this is love, that is jewellery, that is hugs, Supporting brothers in need is a fundamental principle of Freemasonry, and Peter and Amy have not had to cope alone. The Widow's Sons and the Freemasons were incredible. I mean, Amory died on the 12th of December. It was the day of Amy's birthday party. It couldn't have been a more tragic time. But Christmas Eve, when there's a knock on the door and there's two smiling faces standing there with a car full of presents, that was the widow's sons and also members of, of my lodge. We, we could barely get in the lounge on Christmas Day morning for the, for the amount of presents stacked up behind the door. It was just amazing to see, to see her happy. And it had been probably the first time since, since it happened. 
The Brotherhood has not only provided emotional support for Peter, they've also helped out with childcare and counselling. Me and Mum had a little competition. I won a pug. Do you want to see it? It has to look like that. We have the energy from those good times to take us forward. And a lot of Amy's counselling has been based around that. And that has been the tonic for me, and that's what's kept me going as well. After such a devastating loss, Peter's only now feeling ready to get back in the saddle and out on the road with his brothers. Beautiful. The bond that exists between men in Freemasonry is really a brotherhood. Your friends, your colleagues in the lodge are your brothers. The bond between Freemasons is unique. I don't think there's any other organization that's quite the same. If somebody does become upset, then it's kept within the lodge, and then they can come out strengthened. It's certainly it's been valuable to me, and I know many others. You know, I'm a brother, they're my brothers, I'm their brother, so we kind of just get on, get on with it now. And you know, it's all, for, for me, it's for life. Brotherhood is woven into the very fabric of Freemasonry. In London, Freemasons Hall itself is a monument to this belief in comradeship. It was built as a lasting memorial to the 3,000 English Masons who died during the First World War. The United Services Lodge, the Old Wellingtonian Lodge, and Tau Law Lodge, a lodge which comes from a small town in County Durham. When the war ended in 1918, 350 new lodges were set up as traumatized ex-soldiers sought out Freemasonry to recreate the camaraderie they'd experienced in the trenches. Grand Director of Ceremonies Oliver Lodge is himself an ex-army officer. I think there is an appeal because there is that fellowship of men, but also there is a sense of order about Freemasonry. And so, in some respects, that reflects service life. Many servicemen serving and retired become Masons. That is the case now, and it was the case before. One typical example is painter, decorator, and northern soul enthusiast Dave Stubbs, who became a Freemason after a career in the army. A lot of people would join masonry for their own reasons. Mine is that sort of sense of belonging. Dave left school at 16 and spent the next 20 years as a soldier, serving in war zones all over the world. One of the places I did go was to the first Gulf War. And um, that picture there is me as a young man. And um, that was a certificate of commendation that I received for services in the, uh, the Gulf. But like many ex-servicemen, Dave struggled to adjust to life back on Civvy Street. That support structure's gone. You're on your own and you're the one who sits up at night time in the dark and there's nobody to talk to. And you feel thrown away. <laughs> just feel thrown away. The military was a big part of my life. Looking back in retrospect, you know, it's got that similarity, that parallel with Freemasonry, you know, lovely love and, you know, friendship and looking out for each other. Dave has thrown himself into Freemasonry and is about to be rewarded for his dedication to the Brotherhood. He's been nominated to become Worshipful Master. Effectively, the boss of his lodge. I'm very proud of him. I think he's a brilliant mason. For the length of time he's been in Freemasonry, he's done very well to get to worship for master at this stage. He always looks smart, always presents himself wonderfully, and I think it's going to be a, a big buzz for him, to be honest. So I can't wait to see the smile on his face when he comes out of lodge that day. <laughs> so. My granddad used to say, you know, you can tell a man by the tie he ties and the shoes he shines, and I just think, you know, as when you're wearing a the suits, especially on a Masonic occasion, you should make every effort to look uh, as smart as you can. And, 
in particular, you know, me going into the chair as the worshipful master is a case of uh, set an example. Dave's a member of Old Ben Lodge. At the moment, he's at the nomination stage. And today, there's a meeting to give his brethren a chance to voice any last minute objections. Brendan, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. He's still, uh, to use a, an old expression, he's still wet behind the ears, and he's going, to, he's going to mature into the role. Handling proceedings is Old Ben's director of ceremonies, Phil Niblock. The role of a master in a Freemason's lodge is to maintain the standards of his lodge. That's important, and I get involved in that to, to remind him, if necessary, what those standards are. But he's there to, to lead. Worshipful Master, it's the highlight of your Masonic career, you know, the cornerstone, if you like. Sometimes you sort of say to yourself, I don't think I'm really worthy, and et cetera, et cetera, and you try and talk yourself out of it, but I think, you know, there was men before me, and there'd be thousands of men after me, and I can know now that, you know, my name has definitely been written in history. Here's the Freemasons all there, look. You see it? The tower. The third degree involves close questioning, which is where the term giving someone the third degree comes from. The top man in the lodge is the worshipful master who always sits in the east to represent the rising sun. Today, in Shrewsbury, Gulf War veteran Dave Stubbs is attending a lodge meeting where he's hoping to be confirmed as the Worshipful Master. It gives the opportunity for any of the brethren to um, say yes or no. Brethren, we'll take item eight on the agenda. Unless there is a nomination or any brother calls for a ballot to declare the senior warden, brother David Stubbs, as worshipful master elect for this lodge for the ensuing year. Are there any other nominations? As there is no other nomination, I declare that brother David Stubbs is our worshipful master elect for the ensuing year. Worshipful master, brother wardens, distinguished brethren, brethren all, I thank you for your mark of confidence in me, and I look forward to upholding the customs and the traditions and the fine work that you've um, set um, for me to follow in the ensuing year. Brother Organist will now sing the closing ode. As top man in the lodge, Dave will be expected to keep order during meetings, lead the rituals, and decide which charity the lodge will support. He'll be officially installed next time the lodge meets. I'm just very, very proud to be part of something that does nothing but look after its own. It certainly focuses on that brotherly love and uh, all the aspects of humankind. Humankind, it's good. In Newcastle, Widow's Sons leader Peter Younger is also looking forward to a big day. Since losing his wife, his motorbiking brothers have taken a back seat. Due to recent events, I have been able to get out on as many rides as I would like to, but I always make sure that that one date in the year, every year, the Widow Sons National Rally, uh, come hell or high water, I will be able to attend. Today, with daughter Amy staying with friends, Peter can hit the road. Life throws many things at you. 
For some people, they might hit a bottle of whiskey. For other people, they might go out for a meal. For me, to climb on board a motorbike is just incredible. Moments when you're on a motorbike and you see 15 to 20 people on bikes in front of you and the same number behind you, and it's suddenly you think, Struth, they're all Masons. That's, that's quite a moment. The best thing about the Widow Sons I personally have experienced is just the people I've met through it. The term brother comes from the ceremonial side of it, but uh, they're more like family. Obviously, I've known Peter for quite a, lo a long time, and I've known Amy since she was born. Over the last few months since our Marie's died, I mean, Amy's pretty much been Peter's rock. Um, obviously, also, he's been her rock as well, but she's, she's been an absolute godsend for Peter. Chokes people up when you, you tell them, you know, to be fair, chokes me up as well. Um, we're all big soft chites. <laughs> They're a great bunch. But the thing is, what the thing I get what's, what's amazing about this is you see them standing here and they're dressed in leathers and jeans and boots and all this sort of thing. But if they were standing in a lodge in a full regalia, nobody would know that they did this. You know, they, they seem like polar opposites, but in fact they're very, very close and very, very similar. To all poor and distressed brethren, wheresoever they may be, on the land, sea, or in the air. Out to brother, out to brethren! At Freemasons Hall in London, 1,400 of the Brotherhood's leaders are assembling for their quarterly communication. When you see the end of the column go past you by a couple of yards, that's the moment for you to proceed and follow them. OK, let's get clad. The man leading the lavish ceremony is Peter Lowndes, the Pro Grand Master, English Freemasonry's second in command. Despite appearances, quarterly communication is really just a run-of-the-mill business meeting. Anything that's done for Freemasonry has to be voted on and passed and agreed by Grand Lodge. So why bother with all the pomp? Why do we have the changing of the guard? Why do we have the um, Queen's Birthday Parade? Um, why do we have any of these things? Um, of course, they're not essential. Brethren coming together at meetings and the camaraderie that, that, it, um, that it produces that, that really interests me. Brethren, I have to announce that the most worshipful Grand Master has made the following appointments. Worshipful Brother Ian Chandler as Provincial Grand Master for Surrey in succession to Right Worshipful Brother Eric Stuart Bamford, who retired on 24th of May. It, it's one of the few organisations that I've been involved with where I think everybody is on everybody else's side. Now, you can't say that in every organisation. There's often backbiting, hoping somebody will fail so you can take their job. It just simply doesn't happen. So coming to the end of the current Masonic season, enjoy the summer break, and I look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you very much. A little further down the Masonic hierarchy, in Shrewsbury, it's a big day for Gulf War veteran Brother Dave Stubbs. He's about to become the worshipful master of his lodge. I think he's so unnecessarily nervous, to be honest. I think he'll be absolutely fine. I have every faith in him. Well, the first time Dave came in the pub dressed in his Masonic stuff, and I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see many men in the pub in a three-piece suit, I tell you. But, yeah. Dave's been working towards this moment since he first joined Freemasonry eight years ago. I think I'm going to be quite overwhelmed in some ways because, you know, the, the support that I've got um, and the people that are attending today, like I say, they're looking out for me and um, I think I'm going to be quite overwhelmed and quite touched. See you later. Have a good day, you'll be fine. I know. Yeah, All right. You. Love you too. Bless you. 
Mm-hmm. See you later, Bob. Take care. The basic principles of Freemasonry are that all men are equal within the Lodge, which is why we call each other brother. In the Lodge room, you will find a black and white squared carpet. This represents our checkered existence, happiness and sorrow, life and death. Is that all right? I look away a bit there. Former Lance Corporal Dave Stubbs, veteran of the First Gulf War, painter and decorator, and dedicated Freemason, is about to be made the 24th Worshipful Master of Old Ben Lodge in Shrewsbury. You're well on your way, and you just sort of get your, your heart pumping a little bit, you know, a little bit of that sort of positive adrenaline that you need to prepare yourself. Hello, it's Dave Stubbs. Well, I've got a small amount of nerves, as it were, but I think, like, nerves are important because they keep you sharp. And I'm definitely going to have an audience there. And um, it just means a lot to me, personally, to get things right and make the ceremony go the way it should do and good, high-quality ritual. It's an immense day for David, because it's his special day, and we're going to make it as special as we possibly can. Very happy for him. He's worked hard for it as well, you know. Couldn't put a better bloke in the chair. You please get standing to receive the worshipful Demeter Past Master of the Old Ben Lodge, number 9,461, accompanied by the wardens. During this two-hour ritual, Dave will receive a new apron, a new collar, and a gavel. Later, his name will be engraved on Old Ben's master's board. Worshipful Master, you having been installed in the chair of this worthy and worshipful lodge, cannot be insensible to the obligations which devolve on you as its head, or to your responsibility for the faithful discharge of the duties annexed to the appointment. These ancient words remind the new master that his conduct must always meet the standards expected of the leader of a lodge. You will be enabled to lay up a crown of joy and rejoicing, which will continue when time with you shall be no more. And may God give you strength and health to perform the duties of your high office with satisfaction to yourself and advantage to your lodge. So mote it be. I could almost describe it as being the same sense of pride as when I first put my regimental headdress on, you know, passed out the British Army and wearing the Queen's uniform. And likewise, as a worshipful master, I have that same amount of pride. I feel well and worthy. <laughs> David, congratulations. Cheers, Dave. Really You're a top man. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, my Brother friend. David. That's it. Thank you. My day. A very, very special one, which is certainly written in my heart for, a, for as long as I'll ever remember, that's for a fact. Dave's first role as Worshipful Master is to preside over the Lodge's post-ceremony banquet, known as the Festive Board. Its Director of Ceremonies and close friend Phil Niblock's job to deliver the toast to Old Ben's new master. I want just to very briefly give you an insight to this fine young man. Early in his life, 1986, he joined the, the armed forces. They transferred to the Assault Pioneer Regiment. These are people who are first there and last out. And that is an amazing, amazing attribute. He has received a accommodation from the Royal Humane Society for bravery. He got that by saving somebody's life. <coughs> wow. Worship Master, you're a good man. You're a brave man. 
and I think there's a great deal of room, and you've noticed this as well, in Freemasons' lodges for those who <coughs> serve their country. Enjoy your year, worshipful master. It's not going to last very long. <laughs> Brethren, I demand you stand and drink a bumper toast to our worshipful master. Honest brethren, <coughs> point left, right, point left, right, point left, right. One, two. <laughs> The way that Phil delivered his speech, it just sort of reminded me that um, I have done a few things in my life, and um, I'm not just uh, Dave Stubbs, the painter and decorator, who gets dressed up in the morning, who goes to work at 7 o'clock and comes home at 5. Beloved by us all on the square, may your name in the craft with all honour be quaffed and prosper the art everywhere. Get on that chair. Here's a to our worshipful master. Be loved by us all on the square. I just could feel the genuine brotherly love, you know, the genuine belief in me. And, uh, I was quite overwhelmed, really, by the whole experience. I felt humbled. Loved. Brotherly love is at the heart of Freemasonry. But as all Masons are told, family should always come first. Ready? Yeah. In Newcastle, chairman of the Widow's Sons Masonic Bikers Association, Peter Younger, is preparing his seven-year-old daughter, Amy, for her initiation into the biking Ooh, fraternity. Eggs. Are you going to put the um, engine on? No, we're just going to wheel it outside, see how we feel. Ooh. Nice progress, <laughs> how's that? Is that good? Yeah. Oh, I feel nice now. Try starting the engine. No! Go on, just a little bit. No. It won't be loud. No! It won't be loud with your helmet No, on. just don't. Don't? Just don't. Maybe a little bit. Just, no. We'll try something else instead. No! Just put it back in. We'll have to drive it in. Ah. Uh, OK. Ready? <laughs> How's that? Can we try a little bit further? Yeah. Come on in. What are you doing, eh? Hey! Woo! I'm scared. Woo! I think getting through recent events would have been considerably more difficult without the support of Freemasonry and the Widow's Sons. Woo! My challenges now with Amy are really just trying to give her a normal life and just trying to be there for her as a good dad. I can't believe Mum's watching us. She will be. I, th I think about Amory every day. I don't think that'll ever change. Those poignant moments where you know she would have enjoyed it. <laughs> We're not going to go far on a bike, but it's just something you can enjoy together. So we'll see what happens next. So mold it be. So mold it be. Shout out to all my brothers through Freemasonry. Let's meet on the level. I earned three degrees. Had to kill me because they.